The men are behaving. <laughs> okay. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you, um, and this took a lot, a lot of negotiations to get, uh, to get them to come out, but Terry Rubenstein, many of you have, have heard of Terry and the wonderful work that she and her husband are doing in London with the Innate Health Center. They have a fantastic website called innatehealth.co. It is, um, they've been pioneers in the principles world for the better part of, what is it now, almost 10 years? 10 years. Um, there has been some fantastic personalities in the principles world that have learned what they've learned from being introduced uh, to the principles by Terry. So uh, some of the books that you've read have come from people who have been introduced to the principles by Terry. Uh, Terry herself has written two books. Uh, one is Exquisite Mind, which was the first book. The second book was, oh, this is a hard title, but I know it well. The Peach Who Thought She Had to Be a Coconut, another great book on the principles, and I really encourage you to get a hold of that copy, get a hold of a copy of that book. But uh, Terry's been a fantastic supporter of uh, our work here in the United States. She is uh, absolutely, as we say in Yiddish, ibigigeben. She's totally selfless when it comes to helping the community and really trying to make a difference in the world. And I think you'll find that she's way more gracious than me, Terry Rubenstein. I, wanted to, I want to say, I feel like I want to say that Svi and Rabbi Harris are two of my favorite people. I'm not sure if that's sneers, but they are, so I'm just going to say it. <laughs> um, and, and we're just so delighted to be here, so thank you. Um, before, before I start, well, I wanted to kind of start with sharing with you a little quote that I came across that somebody sent me the other day, and then playing you a little video clip that might look like it's got nothing to do with what we're here to learn about, but I promise I'll explain myself afterwards. So I've asked Svi if he'll first put the quote up. This is a quote somebody sent me. I tell my students that if this formula doesn't completely blow them away, then they simply have no soul. Mathematician Chris Budd told BBC Earth, it can be used to describe the geometry of the world. Okay, and now we're just going to watch a little, a little video clip. Oh, shame. People often say that there's beauty in simplicity. And my equation is simplicity incarnate. It has huge potential to change the way we live. It's also a very familiar equation. Most people know it, and you see it on T-shirts all over the world. The equation I'm talking about is E equals MC squared. It's very simple, but what does it mean? Well, let's break it down into its components. First is E, energy. Energy is something that we're all quite familiar with. We eat calories to power us to get through the day. Then we go to the other side of the equation. C is the speed of light. Now, Einstein said that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. The speed of light is actually 300 million meters per second. The other component of the equation is M. Now, M is mass. Mass is the stuff that makes things up. And it's that stuff's inertia, that, that resistance to be accelerated, that defines its mass. But if you take mass, multiply it by the speed of light, and by the speed of light again, then you get energy. It is beautiful in its simplicity, but it also has a special place in my heart. Since I was a child, I've looked up at the night sky and wondered at the beauty of the stars and everything out there. But to see the stars, we need light. And that light comes from E equals MC squared. In the center of stars, atoms are being fused together. Hydrogen and hydrogen fuse together to make helium. When they do that, energy is released. And some of that energy is released as light. Light that we can one day detect with our eyes as it's traveled the many distances across the solar system and across the universe. It is an equation that has a special place in my heart because it enables me to do the things I love. The reason I wanted to start with that is because I feel like what we're going to be learning about, all of us together, over the next three days, is kind of like the E equals 
the E equals MC squared of psychology. And there's something about seeing the formula, the principles um, behind something that, first of all, to me, touches our souls, touches our neshamas, because we see the divinity. We see that there's God behind life. We see that there's God behind reality. And what it also does is it simplifies everything, and it kind of unifies things and puts it back to its source, which is one. And what I loved listening to those mathematicians is that they seeing that. They seeing God in maths. <laughs> they seeing the beauty. They, you, can, you can see she's so lit up by the fact that there's this formula which is not created by human minds. It existed before the beginning of time, and it explains all of geometry, explains all of energy, explains the speed of light. And there's one kind of simple formula that explains all of that. And I feel like that's what we're going to be learning about, this profound formula behind all of our psychological um, experience. And, and I kind of feel like that touches me. And I think that's why when you hear the speaker share, and when I kind of listen to people in the audience who I've heard sharing, um, it touches all of us because it touches a, a soul place, a God place in us, because it's a creation of God and so are we. Now it is. Much better. <laughs> That's the formula. A bit of common sense. So I want to read you something that in 1890, William James, the father of modern American psychology, wrote to somebody called Hugo Munstenberg, a renowned applied psychologist at the time. This is what he said. He said, the truth is that psychology is yet seeking her first principles and is in the condition of physics before Galileo or Newton. Nerve physiology has some laws, even of a quasi-elementary sort, but of a law connecting mind and body, or indeed, of what is the elementary fact of mind, we have not at present even the beginning of a hypothesis which is valuable. So he was saying, we don't have our E equals MC squared in psychology. We have to make do with theories and beliefs and assumptions. But in 1973, a man called Sidney Banks uncovered that formula for us. And those are what we're calling the principles of mind, thought, and consciousness, and what we're going to all be learning about together over the next three days. Um, there's this kind of a metaphor that, that just before I begin, dive into sharing some things with you, that I thought was maybe a little bit helpful and spoke to what Svi was talking about this morning. Sometimes when I'm sharing with people, I say, just think about it that we're learning, a, like as if you're learning about gravity, right? We're learning about almost our psychological gravity, how we work psychologically. And oftentimes when people learn about these principles, they say things like, well, they're just not working for me. And, um, you know, in a way that's saying that gravity's not working for me. You know, if I kind of forget to walk down the stairs and I walk over here and trip and fall down, that doesn't mean gravity's not working for me, right? Gravity's actually working perfectly for me. You know, when we're stressed out or feeling whatever we're feeling, that doesn't mean the principles aren't working. They're working perfectly. They bring to life the full spectrum of our mental experience. You know, there's some people that say, um, I'm, just, I'm just not doing a good job of the principles. You know, I was doing them well yesterday, and I'm not doing them well today. And again, that's, that's like saying I'm not doing a good job of gravity. And what we do, you know, what's interesting is that we don't trip and kind of start to blame the pavement. I mean, sometimes we do. Or blame ourselves, you know. We do, you know, we're clumsy. What's wrong with us? We kind of see that tripping is part of what happens when you misstep and the laws of gravity are in play and you fall down. You know, we see that, we see how that works. And so now we're learning about how we trip psychologically, how, how it all works. Um, so we're learning about our kind of psychological gravity, something that just is. And we can't, we can't there are no exceptions to, the, to, to kind of God's laws. We can't function outside of their truths. Um, but the good news is that we all are beneficiaries of their benevolence. And, you know, to me, if a law or a force or a truth or a gift is created from God, there's so much goodness and kindness and love um, that comes with that. Um, so that's beautiful and that's hopeful. 
What I wanted to share with you, I think Tzvi called this talk and Rabbi Harris, um, Terry's story, A Glimmer of Hope. So I wanted to share with you some stories for the time that we're here together. And while I share them, what I'm going to attempt to do is show you um, the psychological gravity, the E equals MC squared, the constant, what was at play in these stories, and what happens when you overlook the fact of these principles, when you don't see what's, over, what's at play, and to show you what comes out of that, the implications of overlooking that. So I wanted to start with something that I call the dark night of the soul. Sounds a little dramatic, not so hopeful, but we'll get there. Um, and I'm going to take you back to an evening, um, probably I'd say February 2000, and my husband will probably correct me, 2005, around almost 12 years ago. Um, my husband was sitting on a chair outside the ICU unit of the Royal Free Hospital in London. 2003. <laughs> Thanks. That's why I brought him along. <laughs> um, he's my best heckler. And then um, we'll get more of that tomorrow, you'll see. And so he was sitting on a chair outside the ICU unit, and my five, I had five children at the time, five young boys under the age of eight. They were being looked after by um, an au pair of my next door neighbor, who we didn't know at all. Our lives had become very, very insular. We'd kind of withdrawn a lot. And I was um, in a deep, deep sleep, in a coma, in the intensive care unit. And um, I was, in the words of, um, I don't know if you're familiar here in America with Mrs. Large, the children's book. It's like kind of an elephant family called the Large Family. And there's one of their books is called Peace at Last. She's trying to get peace from the kids and she finds a quiet moment where she's in the bath. And so I was at peace at last and I was completely oblivious to the emotional turmoil that Brian was going through and the people that loved me. In fact, I'd actually fantasized of a moment like this of being in a coma or being anesthetized from kind of the torture chamber of my own mind. I'd been going through a, an 80-month depression, what I called the Great Depression, because I'd been through other depressions, but this one seemed so much harder and seemed to go on for so much longer. Now, we can ask ourselves, how could I, I mean, I've asked myself this question, a seemingly intelligent, I was, I think, 27 at the time, um, young woman with a family, kids I loved, I was besotted with my children, a loving husband. How could I get to such a low point? How's that even possible? Now, if you had asked me at the time, I probably would have said something like, well, you know, it was my personality, it was my genetics, it was my chemistry, it was my circumstances, maybe a bit of all of those. That's what I would have said got me to that kind of moment. Um, I now know that none of that was true. It wasn't because of any of that, but at the time I thought it was true. Um, the reason that I had a moment of such extreme, what I'd call non-resilience or desperation, um, was because I was living definitely a lot of the time psychologically as if the world was flat, even though it was really round. I was living as if this, the earth was the center of the solar system when really the sun is. I was living as if all those things I described, my personality, my past, all of those had the power, had power over me um, when they didn't, but I didn't know that. So I was living out of sync with how reality was being created for me. And because of that, um, I got to such a desperate point. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I learned and what changed for me, but what I wanted to, the glimmer of hope that I just wanted to give you now, um, was interestingly what happened at the time was when I came out of hospital, thank God I did and I was fine as you can see, um, I experienced this incredible peace for about six weeks. It was such a deep feeling of peace. Um, it was so all encompassing and it was so mysterious to me because remember, I was in the middle of the worst depression I'd ever been in and I'd just been at my lowest point in hospital. Nothing had changed, you know, it's not like my genes, my you know, meds, and nothing had changed. But yet I felt so peaceful. And at the time I didn't understand it. Um, and I think that I, I even attempted to explain it away, you know, but in hindsight, 
I now understand where that peace came from. I think that I'd been battling in my own mind for so long these thoughts of wanting to hurt myself to just get some peace, you know, wanting to get to sleep. And now that I'd kind of done that, that my worth, you know, it was like that battle was over. And that thinking dropped off my mind, not by my own doing, it just fell off my mind. All that kind of turmoil and thinking. And when it dropped off my mind, what was left was peace. That's just what was left. That was kind of built into my functioning, but I hadn't known that. You know, in my world, something needed to change in order for me to feel that level of peace. I would have said that my circumstances needed to change, my personality, I needed to go through a process of therapy, I needed to do a meditation. I would never have seen that just by thinking, falling off my mind, I could feel that peaceful. And that's just, again, it's just a clue to all of us that there's a way the mind works. There's a way our feelings work and our psychology works. And I've seen the truth of what I just described a hundred times over in the last 12 years. I've seen that when thinking falls off my mind, not by my own doing, because I don't know how to do that, otherwise I would tell you all and probably be very wealthy, but we'll talk a little around um, some of the things that kind of help with that, a direction of learning for that. But when things fall off our mind, when thinking falls off our mind, um, there are deeper feelings built in to our psychological and spiritual reality. And we feel that. We feel that. We feel our spiritual nature is another way of saying that. So, um, so that was the glimmer of hope that I felt at that point, even though I didn't understand it. It was hopeful to me that I could feel that level of peace without anything changing. And it was mysterious, and I was curious about that. I'm going to move away from, from my story for a little bit, and I want to share with you four different stories that I've kind of picked that um, illustrate the fact that there's this constant, there are these spiritual gifts that we're calling mind, thought, and consciousness that are bringing our experience into being every moment we are alive, every moment, moment to moment to moment. But we don't know that. And so we kind of look out into the world and look to like kind of point a finger and see what's going on. We look all around us to try to make sense of what we're going through. And I'm gonna give you practical examples of that because I wanna kind of make this practical for you. So the first story that I wanted to share, which is the first one. Um, the first one was when I, let me share the one when I was six years old. I was six years old and I was going to school. Um, in South Africa, it was called grade one. And my teacher's name was Mrs. Sol. And my brother, who was 18 months older than me, had had her as his first teacher. And he was a very good, smart kid, my brother. And the, this school, I don't know if it's common here in America, and in those days, teachers had pets. They had their favorites. And they weren't subtle about it. And my brother was Mrs. Sol's pet, because he was a grade eight student and he was so good. And I was so determined to go there and also be Mrs. Sol's pet. I wanted to be so good. Um, and I remember it must have been the first week of school, sometime in the first week, Mrs. Sol asked a question and I put up my hand, first kid to put up her hand, and I answered the question and the answer wasn't right. And Mrs. Sol came over to me and she took, this was very common in those days as well, she took her ruler and she slapped my hand with it and, and walked away. And I was absolutely mortified. I was embarrassed, I was ashamed, I, was, I felt so awful and self-conscious at that moment. Now, unbeknownst to me, in hindsight, right now sitting with you, I understand that at that moment, I had a thought that created a feeling for me of that experience of Mrs. Sol. My feeling of self-consciousness, my feeling of shame was born out of thought. It was born out of mind, thought, and consciousness. That's the only way that a feeling can come to life in a human being. But I didn't know that as a little six-year-old girl. So it felt to me like getting an answer wrong had brought that feeling on me. So I wasn't going to get an answer wrong again. Um, it, it felt like Mrs. Sol, the teacher, that incident had somehow made me feel a way I didn't want to feel. So I was going to make sure that that didn't happen again. And what happened is for the rest of my school career, I didn't put up my hand in class. 
even though I knew the answers. I would just sit there and I was so scared to put up my hand and even to this day when I'm in an audience like you guys, I sometimes think twice about saying something that I want to say, putting up my hand in case I get it wrong, even to this day because I have this thing, well, if I get it wrong, then maybe that's going to make me feel the way I don't want to feel. Now, what's so interesting is that there were other children in the class who had a similar experience, right? I wasn't the only one that got an answer wrong and got a little smack from Mrs. Sol. But they just kind of thought, uh, it, didn't, it didn't bother them. Or they thought, oh, she's so mean. I'll kind of show her next time that I've got the right answer. They, they thought differently about it. They didn't feel like Mrs. Sol and that incident and smacking them on the hand had any power over them. They didn't feel victimized by her. They understood that they were free to have any experience of Mrs. Sol smacking them on the hand, and so they did, and they were resilient to that. They were really resilient to that. They understood where the experience was coming from, and they understood that Mrs. Sol had no power to make them feel any way. And so they, they kind of had a lot of freedom that I, I kind of didn't feel that I had. So I'm just, the, the point of that story is to say that as a little child, there was one thing going on. I was experiencing my own thinking in the moment, but I didn't know that. And so it looked to me like there was a lot more going on, and I had to kind of have all these coping mechanisms to make sure that that didn't happen again and I didn't feel that way again. The truth is I felt that way many times because we have thoughts of self-consciousness and thoughts of, you know, we have all different kinds of thoughts. But I was trying really hard to protect myself from something that I didn't need to protect myself from. Anyhow, so that's the one, that's the first story. The second story I wanted to share with you is, um, this, this is along the same theme. I was 18 years old and I now was in secondary school. and. Um, I want you can you can really see how confused I was from these stories. Shame, like I feel sad for me when I think about that. Um, I wanted to be head girl of my school. It was something I'd always had in mind. My brother was again. Can you see the the narrative? My brother was head boy, and I wanted to be head girl. Um, and I really thought that I had a good chance, and so did my peers. And you know, I was kind of a sporty, and I was popular and I, I did all the things that I thought would kind of get me the head girl slot. Anyhow, they announced the head girl and they obviously um, knew a lot more about me than I did because <laughs> they didn't choose me. Um, and I wasn't even made deputy head and I wasn't even made one of the 30 prefects. So I was made nothing. And again, I felt so rejected. I felt so shamed. I felt almost scarred from that. I felt almost psychologically scarred and I went home and I slit my wrists for the first time, right? Just to get relief from that feeling, I, I, I was in so much pain and um, I have the scars today and I look at it and it just sometimes, it just brings such a feeling of wow, that poor little girl who was so confused that I felt that that incident had so much power to create so much pain in me that I needed to do that. And of course it didn't. And I'll give you a, a, a proof for that, that it wasn't that incident that created that pain in me. To eight, 18 years later, I have a son. He's 18. Thank God he's not by my doing, but he's a much more stable, easygoing child. And he's um, it's a different system in the school he's in, and he decides that he's going to put himself forward. You actually put yourself forward to be head boy of his school. And it comes down to two candidates, him and his best friend. And what happens is his best friend gets it, and he doesn't, and he doesn't even get one of the deputies. He gets nothing. At the time, I was in Lacana. Um, I was actually work, doing some work there. And um, I called him. It kind of like brought to mind, but some, I was like, wow, I wonder how he's going to deal with this. I had a pretty good idea, but I called him and I was curious. And I said to him, Kofi, how are you doing? And he said, I'm fine, mom. And I said, but aren't you upset? I'm a good mom. I'm trying to get him to. <laughs> aren't you like a little bit upset or a little devastated? And he was like, yeah, but like nothing. Like, yeah, I'm a little upset. And I was like, well, do you think that you're going to find the next few weeks or months or years at school hard the next year? You know, <laughs> I'm so bad. Um, 
Be- and he's like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what I'll think and feel, but I might have a few days or a few weeks where it feels a bit hard, but, you know, he, he didn't get what I was even asking. You know, he didn't even get it because in his mind, this incident didn't have any power over him. You know, he, his mind was free, and yeah, he might have a moment where he feels upset or disappointed, but he was aligned with the fact that his experience comes from this capacity um, of thought that we're talking about. And so, he was resilient in a way that I wasn't at that moment. Same incident, different ways of seeing it. Um, beautiful, and it's not even that he'd learnt about these principles really. I mean, he'd grown up, it was just that that's the way he understood life, you know? He got psychological gravity in a way that I had to do a lot more learning and still do. So, um, the third story I wanted to share with you was one, one of the solutions that I came up with to try and feel like I um, had more control over my outside world, because I felt like if I could get the outside better, and the outside included me, how I looked, how I you know, was, as you're probably picking up, yeah? The outside was definitely me. If I could get me better in my outside world, then I would feel better. You know, it looked like the outside had to be good in order for me to feel good. So one of the ways I did that was by trying to get thinner. You know, I think a lot of girls and we've picked up boys struggle with this and I had an eating disorder, anorexia and bulimia. And so my parents, we had these kind of cycles where they'd think that I was getting too thin and they'd send me to a therapist, to a psychologist. And I'd kind of begrudgingly go um, try and lie my way and tell them that I was putting on weight and eating and then hope they'd all leave me alone so I could get thin again. So I was sitting opposite the psychologist I was seeing at the time. She was a lovely lady. Her name was Ronette. Um, She was an Israeli woman, probably like in her mid-30s. And I'll never forget, like I've got this image of her. She was wearing the sundress and she had this big smile. She was very unfamiliarly comfortable in her own skin. That was unfamiliar to me, to see somebody that was so comfortable in their own skin. And I remember her looking at me and saying to me, well, why can't you just be like me? Look at me, I've got some meat on my bones. And she kind of like pinched a piece of what looked to me at the time like a copious amount of blubber, you know? It was probably like half an inch of skin. And like, I'm just normal. Like, why why can't you just be like me? And I remember thinking, oh, no, 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 no. (laughs) Like, I can't be normal. I need to be special. I need to be thin. You know, I had this holy grail that I was after where it looked like I needed that in order to feel something inside of me. I was looking for a feeling, it's hard to describe, but we all know it. It's a feeling of belonging. It's a feeling of, it's a soulful feeling. It's like a resonant feeling with the fact that we're spiritual beings. I was just looking to feel comfortable in my own skin. It's a very simple way of saying it. But I felt that I needed to be something other than I was not in order to experience that. And people like Renit were the enemies and my parents because I felt like they were getting in the way of my holy grail. They were, they were trying to stop me from, from reaching. You know, and, and the interesting thing is that all I was feeling during all those years of being so thin were these superficial feelings. You know, these kind of highs and then these terrible lows and you know, that kind of deeper feeling, that soulful feeling. Um, I didn't get that from being thin. So fast forward to just after that story that I began with, The Dark Night of the Soul, six months into that, later. Um, And I'd had a lot of insight, and we'll go back to this a little bit later. And as I'd had insight, kind of thinking had fallen off my mind and something new had been revealed to me in the place of that. And I had a moment, a very powerful moment, which was not by my own doing again, because I had no idea how to do this. But I was standing in my room, I'll never forget this, and my mind must have gone quiet for a moment. And in that moment, I kind of touched a deeper place, a divine place. I 
I touched something that is built into our psychological functioning and reality. It's built into life. It's not built into me or into you. It's, it's in this room right now. It's, it's not a human thing. It's a God thing. And God doesn't only exist in us. He exists in all of reality. So I touched into a deeper feeling and saw that I was a part of that feeling, that I was part of something that was divine and that that was built in and had nothing to do with the way that I looked or the way that I didn't look. It was completely independent of that. And I, I was so um, grateful and so surprised um, by this. And I remember at that moment having this vision of sitting opposite Ronette, my therapist. Just, she almost came back into the room and thinking, wow, she really understood something that I didn't. She understood that it's in what makes us the same. Is that's where we find something that's special. You know, that's where those deeper feelings are. It's in the fact that we're all operating from the same divine energy. You know, that that's that's what makes us special. And there's nothing from the outside that can ever trump that ever. So that was that was a very profound moment for me. You know, I started to learn. It was what I call what Sweet calls an insightful learning moment for me. The next story that I want to share is about a client that I had, a 14-year-old girl. Her name was, um, well, I won't say her real name, we'll call her Sarah. She was a lovely um, religious young girl, and she came to see me because her parents were very concerned um, because she was displaying very what they call dysfunctional behaviors and not acting like a nice religious girl would, or even a nice non-religious girl would. She just was really, what she said to me is that she's looking for attention. She was very insightful and smart, this, you know, she was lovely, and she said, I'm looking for attention. And what she described to me was that there was this chasm in her, there was this big hole, and she said she felt like she was low on love. And she said that because of that, she was looking to do these things in order to fill that hole. But she said it wasn't working. And that's why she was getting quite depressed and down. Because the more she did these things, she just felt worse about herself. Now, we spoke about this feeling low on love. And I asked her, what's that about? And she said that she thinks it started when her older brother um, got cancer. He had a brain tumor. And the family had to relocate countries in order to get treatment for him. And the parents were really concerned about him. And they didn't really have a lot of time for her and the other siblings. So every time she'd kind of say, mom, mom, and try to talk to her mother, and they just relocated countries and schools, her mother would be like, I can't speak to you right now. You know, we're busy, etc. We can't, can't speak to you. And she felt that in those moments, that created her feeling of low on love, that she wasn't given the attention she needed. Um, and then what happened is that, that that belief that she had got exacerbated and built up whenever any of her friends didn't treat her well or she felt let her down. She felt like it just added to this feeling of low on love, just kind of put another notch on the belt of low on love. And she almost, when I met her, uh, I had this vision that she was almost being strangled by this taut belt. Um, of low on love, of feeling low on love. And we sat down and kind of spoke about the fact that low on love was just born of thought. There was a moment when her parents were distracted and they couldn't address her needs, that in her mind she had a thought that was brought to life by consciousness in that moment. And the feeling of that thought was, nobody loves me. That was the feeling of that thought. That's all it was, right? But she didn't know that. Because she didn't know that, it felt like that feeling was coming from her parents' behavior. That's what it looked to her. It looked that that feeling was coming from her parents' behavior. It was invisible to her because thought is invisible, right? We live in this world of thought and it's completely invisible. So we overlook the fact of it and we look to see, well, what's creating it? I'm not feeling good. Oh, well, mom's ignoring me. It must be her, right? Well, a friend was mean to me. It must be them. And that's what we're pointing to here throughout these three days. And it's something that I'm learning about and learning about. And it's, I overlook this all the time. You know, I've, I teach this. I've been sharing this for 10 years. 
and this fact of thought creating my experience in the moment, I forget it all the time. So Sarah didn't know this and instead felt that she created this belief that every time her needs weren't met, um, this was creating feelings of trust and resentment and disappointment and kind of putting fuel into this low on love. When she, when we started to learn together and she realized that but for the thought, low on love, she wouldn't be feeling low on love. There is no other way to experience a feeling but through thought. And she saw that. She saw without the thought, there's no experience of it. And we spoke about the fact that I too, with my kids, am often so distracted. You know, we've got, thank God, six kids and a busy life and run the Nate Health Center. A lot of the time they're coming in and telling me things and I, I, I can't listen to them. You know, some of the time I'm judging them, some of the time I'm irritable with them. All those things that she described her parents do. But what's so interesting to me is that my boys aren't bothered. They kind of just think, oh gosh, mom's distracted or mom's living in her own world, you know, or mom doesn't understand. Anything that their resilient mind offers up to them, you know, and they'll all have their own versions that they'll share with you. But as far as I can tell, unless I'm really out of touch, none of them assume because I'm not listening to them or meeting their demands that that's creating a feeling of low on love in them, that they're, you know. So this girl was so struck by that. And it was the beginning of her learning that you know, we have a mind that is resilient and intelligent, and it offers us up insightful thinking, thinking that is designed to know how to deal with these tricky human interactions that happen in the world. Because there's lots of them, right? There's people who behave badly, there's people who don't treat us right, there's people who say they'll do things and they don't, there's mothers who get mean, and you know, all these kinds of things. I'm, I'm one of those people, I do all of those things, not intentionally, not because I want to be a bad person, but just because I'm living in my own mind and sometimes oblivious to other people's realities. You know, I'm living out of my own thoughts. But thank God we have this mind that has this insightful, intelligent thinking that can offer us resilient thinking for those moments, thinking that's helpful for us. And this was the start of um, Sarah learning about that, learning that but for the thought of love, she was filled with a river of love. But for the thought I can't trust anyone, you know, she could learn to trust that her mind would help her navigate life moment to moment. Um, and other people. So that, that's, that's my story of Sarah. So all those stories have a constant theme running through them, which is the fact that experience is created from these principles, mind, thought, and consciousness. We don't always see that. I don't see that to this very day. I'm sure later this afternoon I won't see that and I'll be kind of blaming my husband or Tzvi or Abba Harris for something, right? Why did they put me on when I was jet lagged, you know, something? So, and when we don't, um, it's almost like we feel non-resilient. We feel non-resilient to laugh. And, you know, what we're learning about here today, hopefully, is giving us a logic, is giving us a, something that is going to help us become and feel more and more and more of our innate resilience. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to my story for a, for a moment, just to pick up a piece from there. Um, are we still OK for time? How, what does that mean? 10 minutes left, OK. So William James, coming back to William James, and I was introduced to him by Dr. Keith Blevins, and, and Keith knows a lot more about him than I do. Um, so most of what I say I heard from Keith, and then I read, I read myself um, a little bit more about, about him. And he believed that there was mental health in mental life. And that doesn't mean like in my mental life and yours and yours and yours and yours, but not yours, you know, you struggle a bit too much or not yours. He believed that there was mental health in mental life for everybody, but that we couldn't kind of almost pin it down because we didn't have psychology's first principles. We couldn't locate it. We couldn't say, well, that's what it is. It was elusive to us until we'd found psychology's first principles. And he believed that when we did find psychology's first principles, then psychology wouldn't be a philosophy, it would be a science. 
That's why we started with the E equals MC squared. Because to me, I see it that um, there's a science and a logic to these principles. There's a way that experience works that's very predictable and reliable. You know, you can start to see, like I can see with my kids, they feel stress now. They get that that's thought. They get that stress is thought. It doesn't mean if they're stressed about exams or about their friends or about anything. They see that there's one way the mind works and they, they can keep looking to that way. There's a logic that keeps on teaching them. Oh, and kind of they see what's going on, what's going on. So I was starting to wake up to the fact that there was mental health in me because I was a human being. And one of the ways that I woke up to that was that after that incident that I described in the hospital, I, st I started to read lots and lots and lots of books. Um, you know these kind of books of people who faced adversity, struggle, and then kind of transcended that? So I just read like, oh, my, my husband, it drove him mad. Um, I think it was the bank account that worried him <laughs> every time I came home with another one of these books. And it didn't matter if the person was struggling with a psychological issue or a physical issue or somebody that crashed in the Andes or somebody who was trying to get a record deal and you know kept getting rejected. I was just interested in adversity and then how we transcend that, what accounts for that. And what started to dawn on me, and this was very powerful and it was very subtle, but it became more and more visible, was in all these stories, every individual was different. Some of them came from poverty. Some of them, they all had different genetics. They had different personalities. Some of them came from very abusive backgrounds. Some came from very loving homes. Um, all these individual differences, right? They all had individual differences, but yet there seemed to be some kind of common thread that in spite of their individual differences, they transcended or their adversity. And it kind of knocked the wind out of the sails of my theory at the time, which was, well, I'm not doing so good here because of my individual differences, because of my personality, because of my background, because of my current circumstances. I had all these reasons. And this kind of knocked the wind out of the sails of that theory, because I saw that in spite of all these individual differences, there was something else, something that was common to all these human beings, to all these stories that allowed them to transcend you know, and kind of get over what they were struggling with. And at the time I called it the human spirit or the human potential because I didn't have a better word. Um, but it made me hopeful. It gave me hope because if it was within the human spirit, then I was a human, so it must be within me too. Um, but it was only when I came across these principles 18 months later, and by this time I was, my life had changed, and, and, and that's another story, I was doing a lot better, um, that I knew that that was what the common thread was. Because I came across these principles that were universal, that were the same for every human being. If you're a human being, your psychological experience is born from these principles, moment to moment to moment. And I was like, well, that's it. That's it. Now I had something that I could really knew for the rest of my life I could learn about. It wasn't intangible. It wasn't airy-fairy. I could learn about these. And there's so much depth. You know, there's such a simplicity to these principles, but there's so much depth and so much learning, kind of infinite learning in them. And I was really, really um, grateful. So I wanted to just end with a little story that I've told once before at a conference that, um, that I love. So I'm just really sharing it with you because I love it. But I do think that it encapsulates everything that I've said in a way. Um, and really speaks to the fact that when we find a logic that's true, and to me logic is very deep. I don't see logic as something um, that's just scientific or something. To me, a, a true logic, a God logic, is something that's got so much depth because it's showing us what, what underlies this physical world that we see. It's showing us the deeper order of life. And when, to me, when you look to the deeper order of life, you see God. That's what you see. So to me, logic is God's truth being revealed to us. So it just shows that the story encapsulates how logic can be so simple and so helpful and so practical, but yet it can be so deep at the same time. So there was once a farmer who discovered he'd lost his watch in a barn. It was no ordinary watch because it had sentimental value for him. 
and after searching high and low among the hay for a long while, he gave up and enlisted the help of a group of young children playing outside the barn. He promised them that the person who found the watch would be rewarded. Hearing this, the children hurried inside the barn, went through and around the entire stack of hay, but still could not find the watch. Just when the farmer was about to give up looking for his watch, a little boy went up to him and asked to be given another chance. The farmer looked at him and thought, why not? After all, this kid looks sincere enough. So the farmer sent the little boy back in the barn. After a while, the little boy came out with the watch in his hand. The farmer was both happy and surprised, and so he asked the boy how he succeeded where the rest had failed. And the boy replied, I did nothing but sit on the ground and listen. In the silence, I heard the ticking of the watch and just looked for it in that direction. It's a great story, right? Yeah. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I so enjoy being here. Thank you for being so welcoming. And I enjoy the next few days of us all learning about this together, because I'm still learning too. <laughs> I trip over my own feet all the time, psychologically and physically. Thanks, V.